are just so delighted to be back in business this year. Two years ago, we, uh, well, we had to cancel the Bach Festival, as many things were canceled. And then last year, we had a virtual festival. We had, I believe, four events. And they're still on the Peoria Bach Festival channel, if you want to, if you miss them. There are some wonderful concerts. It's weird performing f for no audience. But uh, they, they, we, they did a good job. So um, part of the reason we started this festival, which was 2003, almost 20 years ago, was that, um, well, we kind of centered it around Bach cantatas. And these pieces, well, I'll, that's kind of what this lecture is about, I'll explain. But uh, they're usually for a small orchestra, a small choir, and soloists. And they're impractical for most college groups because the solos are so difficult. Uh, they're obviously impractical for most church choirs. And uh, for symphony orchestras, they're just kind of too small and too intimate. So who's left with the Peoria Bach Festival and groups like like us, and we are blessed to have so many um, fine musicians who keep coming back. A lot of them are in various parts of the country. And, uh, and it's just a delight for us all to get together and do this music. Even if nobody comes like last year, it's still a delight. The concerts that we give usually contain instrumental music as well as choral music but mainly the cantatas are the, the principal uh, genre that we uh, perform. And uh, this is such a wonderful church. It's a Lutheran church for one thing. I'll say a little bit more about that too. But uh, it's just a wonderful situation, wonderful um, setting. And we appreciate so much that we're able to use this space every year. So, what exactly is a cantata? We'll begin with, what is a Bach cantata? It's generally a musical work of about 20 minutes duration. It's uh, presented in a Lutheran service, church service, before the sermon. And it uses one of the prescribed biblical passages for the day. Those of you who attend liturgical churches like Episcopal or, or uh, Lutheran are used to this idea that it's spelled out ahead of time what biblical passages will be read and would be used for the sermon for a particular day. It, this is handy for a composer if you're writing a piece for every Sunday. You get a little bit of a warning uh, and it's not like a non-liturgical church where this pastor may tell the minister of music that morning what the sermon is about, and, and you just hope that the Holy Spirit has coordinated things. But uh, musical work of about 20 minutes duration, it generally has vocal solos, and we'll talk about this a little bit, um, arias and recitatives. And uh, it's divided into sections, and each small section features one of the soloists, and it always ends with a chorale which is uh, basically a Lutheran hymn. And um, we don't know whether the congregation was expected to sing these chorales. One of the ones that I'm gonna play today, it would be pretty easy because it just treats the tune the way the congregation knows it. But some of Bach's settings are a little more intricate uh, and would be a little tough for a congregation. There were people that didn't like his music anyway in the congregation. This is usually the case in uh, a lot of churches. But um, anyway, we'll get into that too. The other thing about cantatas, the Bach cantatas, they're, they're generally in the vernacular, which for Bach would have been German. Uh, all of the Catholic church music was Latin. And uh, therefore, it could be sung in any country. Uh, because it was not specific to a particular language. Um, Luther, Martin Luther was, of course, the, the, uh, the main 
purpose in the Reformation around 1520s, 1525. But uh, his influence goes far beyond that. For one thing, his translation of the Bible sort of codified the German language. There were all these different dialects. There still are a lot of different dialects in Germany. But the, the Lutheran Bible became the standard uh, way of speaking German. Also, for all of these democratic revolutions that took place, it's kind of, uh, Luther was certainly, his influence is certainly part of that. But uh, because the whole idea was to bring the service back to the people and not just the professional priests. So, uh, the other thing is that a church service was the big event of the week. There probably wasn't that much to do in Leipzig outside of Sunday morning. So you would come to church and you would spend three hours. You'd expect to hear a good long sermon and you would expect to hear some good music. So uh, many of us can't imagine spending three hours in a church service, but for them it was, and that's still true in many parts of the world today. It's the big event of the week. Uh, not every Lutheran church was able to do a Bach cantata. It would have to be a church in a university town, a church where there was a, uh, a boy choir attached to it and the instrumental resources. So it would be mainly the bigger cities and the more sophisticated churches. Um, in Bach's case, uh, oh, and the other thing is that the, the, the music director, everybody, we, we didn't have separation of church and state back then. And uh, if you were working in the church, you answered to the town authorities, who generally were not terribly musical. And this caused uh, no end of problems to, for Bach. He complained about the authorities, but the authorities complained about Bach also. So it was a mutual uh, distrust, I suppose you could say. I'm sure I've told this story before, but for a while Bach played these long organ, organ preludes and the authorities said, the preludes are too long, they complained to him. So he played really short preludes. And then they said, the preludes are too short. So now the word cantata comes from the Italian cantare, which just means to sing. And the word sonata comes from sonare, or sonore, which mean, what would that mean? Latin scholars. Sound. So an instrumental piece would be sonore, and a, a vocal piece would be cantate, or cantare. So the word cantata simply means to sing, or something that's sung, as sonata simply means something that's played, rather than sung. Now these words came to have more specific meanings than that, but uh, here's a very, very quick overview of the history of music. Music started with chant and dance, and that makes sense when you think about it. Chant, uh, mostly religious, melody, but not necessarily very rhythmic. Dance would be rhythmic music, and in a lot of countries, especially African countries still, the word for music has to do with dance. You can't sing, you can't make music without moving. That's usually not true in Lutheran churches. But, uh, so before the Renaissance, and we're talking roughly 1300, 1350, up to about 1600, mostly music was not written down and was either as I said, chant or dance. Uh, slow melodic music from religious chant, rhythmic, mu rhythmic music from dance. And church musicians began notating chant because you know, you, when you, you can memorize a certain number of tunes, but after a while it gets more difficult. And they had all these different tunes or chants for various biblical passages and uh, other passages that you would uh, sing in church. So they um, experimented with writing them down, and we won't go into all of that, but at a certain point, there were brave experimental people that thought maybe we can put two voices together doing different things. 
This was a radical idea uh, instead of just one voice at a time. And then gradually we got more voices. So uh, the standard was four or five voices and Palestrina who lived mainly in the 1500s was, uh, especially the end of the 1500s, was seen as the ideal model, his, his music, um, of several voices moving and, and making music together. And in church, usually these were called motets. Um, but then, um, Oh, and another thing about that is that most of the instruments at the time performed kind of in the main, the same range as the voice. So you could substitute, say, a recorder for a voice. If you were singing a madrigal, a five-voice madrigal, and you didn't have an alto, you know, use a recorder, or use a, a viol, or something like that. And it wasn't until around 1600 when composers started marking instruments more specifically so here was the big new thing towards the end of the 1500s, and it was opera. And opera kind of had a new set of rules. And you had songs, which are called arias, and you had sung speech, which were, was called recitative. And the sung speech, and this was true in, in early opera and the operas of Handel and the operas of Mozart, and, 18th century opera. The sung speech, the recitative, was to move the action along. Like, I don't think she likes me. I think I should go into the next room. Something like that. And then the aria, the song, is about a mood or, you know, how much, how sad I am, how happy I am. I am so happy. Something like that. And the action, it doesn't move the action along. That doesn't mean that the singer just stands still, but uh, so you have these things, and since you couldn't do opera everywhere, especially in the church, there was a, another form that evolved, especially in Italy in the 1500s, and it was called cantata. And this was a, usually a secular song or I should say a secular work, usually involving a soprano soloist and a, a keyboard instrument like a harpsichord. And it would be divided into arias and recitatives. And usually the subject was mythical heroes from ancient Greece. There are lots and lots and lots and lots of these. Um, I'm not sure how many Telemann wrote. He wrote 1,700 church cantatas. Telemann was probably the most prolific composer who ever lived. They said that he wrote music like you would write a letter, although no one writes letters anymore, so maybe that's not apropos. But uh, so uh, you had this new type of secular music, and a lot of the German composers studied in Italy and were anxious to become fluent in writing like the, uh, like the Italians wrote. Handel spent three years in Italy in his late teens, early 20s. He was a big hit. He wanted to learn how to write Italian music, and in short order, um, his music was more popular than the Italian composers. He was just very, very talented. But a lot of the German composers who studied in Italy were church composers, and they were trying to figure out how to adapt this kind of music for church, and they came up with... Uh, actually some Italian composers also, what they called uh, cantate spirituale, spiritual cantatas. And so this was the new music that Bach was exposed to. When Bach started writing his cantatas, which was around 1707, something like that, this was still a new thing in the churches. It wasn't totally accepted, but the um, the pastors who kind of wanted, you know, it's like they wanted the, the praise band in the church. Uh, they wanted to do something that would attract people, and this seemed to be uh, the way to do it. And so, um, 
I kind of already said this, church music has always been kind of a war zone. There were plenty of church authorities who thought the church was selling out to the world by bringing what they called opera into the church. But Lutherans had a staunch ally. Who was that? Martin Luther, two centuries before. Martin Luther was a trained musician. He loved music. He felt that music could say uh, almost as much as scripture and that it was extremely important in the church. A number of the church fathers, including Augustine, weren't even sure you should sing in the church because they were afraid that anything that was a little bit sensuous or a little bit you know, worldly would draw people away. But Luther just didn't have that idea at all. In fact, he would use some of the drinking songs and the tunes from the world in his hymns because uh, apparently he actually said, why should the devil have all the best tunes? So, uh, one of Luther's major reforms, this is back in the early 1500s, was to bring music back to the people. He advocated for the use of chorales and hymns sung by the congregation. Um, now, I have a slight, I don't know if I can say this in here, I have a slight, slight problem with Martin Luther because he persecuted my ancestors, the Mennonites, and he wasn't too kind to the Jews. And uh, I suppose with a lot of these incredibly um, important people, there are definite flaws, and he, he had them. But he was a boon for musicians. All church musicians can be thankful to Martin Luther for his stalwart advocacy. Now, Bach learned to compose, and, um, and this is the way practically all composers learn to compose, by copying the music of other people, of other composers. You, you usually, I mean, there was, there was some printed music, but it would have been way too expensive for a kid. And uh, so you would find the music of others and you would copy it by hand, and you would get very good at it. And when you think about people like Handel and Bach and Telemann, you can't even imagine the physical act of writing all the notes that they wrote, much less how intelligently they wrote them. So, um, so that's how Bach built up his music library. And uh, there are a lot of stories about that that I, if you've come to previous lectures, you've heard even if you've forgotten them. Also, he sang in a church boy choir as, as did Palestrina, Purcell, Haydn, and most composers throughout the 18th century. And that kind of makes sense. That's where they were first exposed to good music and actually singing it and, and feeling the vibrations of it uh, apparently lured them into the practice of writing it themselves. Uh, so, and, and Bach came from a family of musicians. His uncle, Christoph Bach, was a very fine composer. I believe there are one or two cantatas that used to be attributed to Johann Sebastian Bach that they found out his uncle wrote. And uh, that has happened for a lot of composers who, you know, people said no one else could possibly have written this. And it turns out someone did. But, uh, Bach, he didn't, or we're not aware of things that he might have written when he was five or eight, like Mozart, but he was spending that time well. He was studying music. He was studying, uh, practicing the keyboard. He was learning everything he could about music. He had one of those Einstein brains for music. He just understood what he heard, and he uh, digested it, and he was able to use it in his own music. One of the first cantatas that we have uh, of Bach was written uh, at the ripe age of 22. But this cantata, and it's number four, it's an Easter cantata, Christ lag in todes banden, Christ lay by death enshrouded. It's incredible. It's one of my favorite pieces ever, and it's one of the first ones that he wrote. And it's as if he had been storing up all of this um, ability and just kind of put it out there in this one cantata. It was an audition cantata for a job that he wanted, so obviously he spent time on it. 
But it kind of reminds me when I was a, when I was a choir director in a church, there was a youth pastor once, uh, he was there for a few years, never got a chance to preach until the pastor finally said he could preach on a Sunday night. He was so excited. He talked about everything he knew, everything he had ever learned from anyone, and uh, went on for quite a while. But, uh, well, actually, no, I don't think it did. I don't think it took very long. But, uh, so Bach just threw everything in here, and there, but it wasn't superficial things. He, he knew how to use images, figures, um, things like when, when he set the word kreutz, which means cross in German, it would always have a sharp next to it because the word for sharp in German is kreutz. It's the same word. And often he would do a little musical thing, da di da di da which represented a horizontal and a vertical line. And his music is just full of things like that. It's full of n numerical um, pu math puzzles, things like that. It's, it's as if he had this excess of ability so he could write a piece and then go back and, I mean, if he did go back, maybe he wrote it that way to begin with and put all these things into it. And that's part of the reason why well, he wrote at least 250 cantatas, that's quite a few. But he didn't write 1,700 like Telemann. And that's because Telemann was able to use formulas and just kind of pump it out, and Bach just couldn't do that. There were composers, including the French Baroque composer, Jean-Baptiste Lully, whom I've never liked very much because he was a bully composer. Um, when I did my doctorate, my final project was on the French Baroque composer Marc-Antoine Charpentier. And Lully knew that Charpentier was a better composer than he was, and he did everything he possibly could to squash him. Um, we won't get into that. The reason I mention it is that Lully would write the melody and the bass, and then he would hand the music off to one of his assistants to fill in the viola and the second violin part, which he just felt weren't very important anyway. And Bach instead does these little hidden things in the inner parts that unless if you're a second violinist or a violist, you'll never know what's going on there. So um, we're going to listen to a little bit of this cantata. What makes it old-fashioned is that it is um, what's called a chorale cantata. And this was the kind of cantata that composers like Heinrich Schütz, who lived 100 years before Bach, this is the kind of church music they would write. They would take a chorale or a hymn, which usually, in most church hymnals nowadays, most hymns have three to four verses, but that wasn't true back then. They would have, you know, 17 verses, whatever. I know when I was in Haiti, I would often go to an Episcopal church there, and most of the people were illiterate, and they just knew all these verses by heart. You were just expected to know that. And uh, to bring a hymnal into the church was kind of a mark of shame because it meant that you hadn't memorized all the hymns. So uh, this was old fashioned in that it took uh, this particular chorale, which happened to be written by Martin Luther. And it had been set to a medieval tune, which Bach changed just a little bit. But he takes this tune and this uh, chorale and he sets every verse differently. We're going to take a quick look at that now. He wrote a number of chorale cantatas, and then he moved on to the more operatic type. But uh, every one of his chorale cantatas is different. He just had no um, lack of imagination. And this is something that Bach, as a composition teacher, emphasized. Uh, if you were in school in those days, you would study rhetoric. I think I gave a lecture about rhetoric a few years ago, the different parts of rhetoric. But the first one is invencio, invention, which means you've got to have an idea. So you can be very skilled at putting a speech together, but if it doesn't say anything or if there's nothing important in it, it's hardly worth saying. And this is what Bach said to his composition students. Uh, learn all of the craft, learn uh, you know, all the counterpoint and the theory and all of that. But if you don't have a good idea, do something else. 
don't be a composer. I mean, this was way back then, and he was already saying, we've got enough bad music already. So, uh, so Christlag in Todesbanden, it's centered around the great hymn of Luther. Um, and I've been talking about all of this intellectual content it has, but at least in, to me, there's something that's immediately engaging about it, even if you don't, you're not aware of any of that. It's like something's going on here and it's very serious. And one of the reasons why I have advocated for the performance of sacred music in the public schools is that you are dealing with religious ideas, but you're singing or playing music of the great composers and it's dealing with fact, things like life and death. And I see some of the music that, choral music especially, that replaces sacred music in the schools. And it just seems to deal often, at least, with very trivial things. But Bach is talking about life and death. And Luther's hymns are powerful. I mean, he really knew how to use imagery and how to put across the ideas that he's trying to put across. So um, this cantata, and I don't have a PowerPoint here, but it's constructed like a pyramid. It's got seven verses. Is that true? One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, seven verses. Starts with a little sinfonia, a little very short instrumental prelude, which just presents some of the ideas of the tune but it presents it in such a way, kind of like the overture to Handel's Messiah, like this is hopeless. That's kind of the way you feel in the beginning. But then he has a chorus for four voices, a duet for two, a solo for one. In the middle, a chorus for four voices, then a solo for one, a duet for two, and ends with a chorus for four voices. So it's four, two, one, four, one, two, four. Just a perfect symmetry there. And each verse ends with hallelujah. Um, his music is full of figures and allusions and intricate counterpoint and other intellectual devices. And, but I already said this, it's still captivating to the ear. So we're gonna hear a little bit of this, I hope. This is a Bose CD player, which at one time worked great. Now it's a little temperamental. If it doesn't work, this will be a very short lecture. But uh, here's, I hope, the Sinfonia from Bach Cantata Number no. 4. This is a recording from, uh, guess where, the Peoria Bach Festival Choir and Orchestra. And soloists, no, uh, well, I'll say something about that. It's from the year 2008, when we had already been going for five or six years. Uh, the thing about this chorale cantata and being one of the first that he wrote we don't think it was actually written for soloists, but for the entire choir to perform, like the soprano alto movement, all the sopranos, all the altos sing. And that's the way we're performing it here. Um, there are reasons for that. Here we go, let's see if this works. I will be uh, periodically turning my back to you, but it's just to check the track and make sure it's on track. Yes. That's just the first two notes of the tune. So immediately you know that there's drama taking place. Then when we go to the first chorus, can you hear me when I'm speaking over the, okay. When we go to the first chorus, he takes the tune apart and has the soprano sing it very slowly. And then the other voices underneath are using material from that particular tune or that piece of the tune. And every verse ends with hallelujah stated differently. So here's the first chorus. 
And if you listen for the top, the sopranos on top, they're singing the tune. Is that loud enough back there? It's probably pretty loud up here in front. This is the second phrase of the chorale. Christ lay in death's dark bonds, given up for our sin. Then the third phrase is he's risen from the dead. So there's more energy here. It's more triumphant. Here's the soprano melody. We're going to cut to the hallelujah. Everyone singing hallelujah. Hal And then listen what happens after the tenors sing that one more time. Goes into double time. That church must have wondered what is going on up there in that choir loft. So that's probably more hallelujahs than they'd heard in that church for a long time. The second movement is much more somber, and I think it's just amazing the way the soprano and alto voices keep bumping into each other. I'm going to cut to the hallelujah here, and it's a very different hallelujah. They keep going into each other, the different voices.
Then comes one of Luther's verses about life and death battling each other. You hear the battle in the violins. And then the tenors sing this strongly together. The next chorus is a four-part chorus, and it takes the battle imagery even farther. It was a wonderful array. happening here is the voices the voices are all converging and the text talks about one death swallowing the other death and Bach just has these voices coming together and exiting one at a time here's the hallelujah The next movement is a solo for the bass section, and it's very warm and rich. And one of the reasons we think this was written for choir rather than solo bass, there's a part in the middle where he sings about death and, and sings one of the lowest notes a bass can hit, an E sharp way down there. And then he goes up to one of the highest notes that a bass can hit and sings about the slayer can harm us no more and just holds this note forever. Let's see if I can find this spot. Here it comes, death. Strings are scratching. Yat, 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 yat. And it sounds like all is hopeless, but hang on. Life wins. The slayer can no more harm us. And these hallelujahs start very haltingly and get more and more bold.
then I'll play just a, the opening of the I'll play just the opening of the alto tenor duet but it's dancing The alto and tenor are actually singing in different keys, but you don't notice. And here's the chorale that possibly the congregation sang along. I see we're running out of time, so I am going to play just a little bit of cantata 75, which is one of the cantatas which will be performed Friday night at the concert. And uh, this is uh, an operatic cantata. This was the first cantata that Bach wrote in his position as music director at Leipzig. It's probably one of the hardest ones we've ever sung. I was wondering, we said something to the choir last night about maybe Bach wanted to scare them to death. But uh, it has 14 movements and that's one of Bach's little numerical signatures. Does anyone know where he, we get, he gets the 14? B would be what? Two. A would be one. C would be, it's not that difficult, three. H would be, work it out, eight. What is eight and three and two and one? 14, so that's Bach's signature. So there are 14 movements, and play just a little bit of it. The machine is cooperating, I'm delighted. So Bach does similar things In this cantata, it's not quite as compact as cantata number four, but he starts with kind of a French overture. It, the, this cantata 75 is about rich and poor, and it's about, the first half is about the vanity of earthly riches, and the second half is about the blessing of spiritual riches. So he starts with a kind of a French overture signifying pomp and ro royalty. But there's this oboe pleading. So this is the poor shall eat and be satisfied. Here's a recitative with the bass. This is not us, by the way. I actually think our bass sings better. Here's an aria. So he sets this tune, a little tune, and then he just uses variations of the tune throughout the movement. And all the, all the movements are short.
Next comes a recitative for the tenor. So you can hear that the keyboard just holds chords. And this is kind of like sung speech. Then comes an aria for the soprano. She's singing, I accept my suffering with joy. a recitative for soprano. This is number six. Number seven, a chorale. After this movement, you would hear this sermon in a two-part chorale, a two-part cantata. You would hear this sermon after the first part. And the second part would be after the sermon. We just had the three, the hour sermon. Here's part two. And it's purely instrumental with a trumpet playing the tune. Bach actually did not write that part that high. I don't know why this performer is taking it an octave higher. Then comes the recitative, which we will skip, an aria, which we will skip, another recitative, which we will skip, and then this aria for bass, has a trumpet solo. And it talks about flames of love. That's what the trumpet is doing. An incredible movement. Then we end with the same chorale. Oh, there's another recit. The same chorale that the first part ended with, but with different words. So if you come Friday night, which I hope you all will, you'll hear this live without these interruptions. And uh, we have a fantastic trumpet player, so that last aria will be worth the price of admission. Also, there are wonderful concerts at noon, um, tomorrow at 12.05. Emmy Holmes Hicks and Adriana La Rosa Ransom are both playing solo Bach pieces, Emmy for violin and Adriana for cello. And uh, they are both just excellent. It's gonna be wonderful. Friday at noon at 12.05 will be a woodwind chamber music concert, all Baroque music. That'll be wonderful too. Janet, Janet Engel, Lisette Kielsen, Blake Duncan, um, Carol Wessler, uh, Jan Janet Engel, oboe player, and uh, Adriana again on the cello. And then Friday night at eight o'clock is the cantata concert with a pre-concert lecture at 7.15 by Dr. Maurice Boyer who will be our guest conductor, he's from Chicago. A fabulous conductor and it'll be great. So thank you for coming today. I have no food for you, but uh, if you are so moved, you are welcome to help us out with the costs. There's a offering plate outside the door here. And thank you very much.